So welcome everyone to the lightning talks. This is the first lightning talk of five that we're going to be doing during the Open Aperio conference. Uh, this is the place where the, the talk is lightning fast and the illumination is intense. Um, I'm Martin Ramsey, the managing director of the LAMP Learning Consortium. I'm going to be your moderator today. So the way this is going to work is each of our presenters will just have five minutes to do their presentations, which is why we call it the lightning talks. And so presenters, um, to you particularly, I'll ask you to be ready as soon as the previous presenter finishes up so that uh, we, do, we don't waste any time in between sessions. I'll introduce each presenter very briefly uh, so that I don't take time away from what you have to tell us. Uh, if you want to know more about each of the presenters, the Open Imperio schedule has a nice biography on each one that you can take a look at. And presenters, when it is your turn, um, you can take the presenter privileges by clicking on your name in the uh, in the in the chat, not the chat, sorry, in the in the messages section, um, and uh, then you can step through the slides if you gave me slides in advance uh, at your own pace. If you want to share your screen instead, you can do that too. Um, I encourage you to use your camera so that people can see you. It's nice to put a, a face with uh, what's being said, and I will be keeping time. So uh, as you get close to the end of your five minutes, if you see this. That means your time is just about up, and so uh, you need to you need to be wrapping it up. Uh, so this is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to this. One of the things that has happened is that uh, I've been been quite impressed by the number of um, people that we have from all over the world. So we're actually going to start in South Africa today, um, and by the time we're done, we're going to end up in in Florida. Um, we'll we'll make stops in the Netherlands and Scotland and uh, uh, Montreal on this particular um, series of lightning talks, and then there will there will be three or four more of these. So we'll have a bunch of lightning talks when it's all when it's all said and done. So I'm really glad to have that, and I think we should just go ahead and get started. So um, let's see. The first one is actually going to be a pre-recorded um, lightning talk. So I'm going to turn it over to to Jen and let her uh, take it away. A day in the life of a virtual ruler consultant. My name is Donna Lewis and joining me in this video is my colleague Desiree Mackay. We are learning technology consultants here at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, also known as UCT. We work in a department called SILT, the Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning. We work in training and consulting on pedagogy and the technology that accompanies it. We are also known as the Vula Help Team and we focus primarily on technical support of our version of Sakai, known as Vula. We advise on the best layout according to discipline-specific needs, best practices, authentic assessments, and the technical functionality on Vula, including the glitches. COVID-19 resulted in what we refer to as emergency remote teaching that focused on low data and asynchronous teaching and learning strategies. Present day, we have shifted from emergency remote teaching to physically distanced learning. It's online teaching and learning with selected form of physically distanced face-to-face -face teaching. So what does a day in the life of a now virtual Vula consultant entail? First thing in the morning, we log on to a very full mailbox and unpredictable day. We clear our mails and log on to our query tracking system called Jira. We also log into Teams, mainly used for internal meetings and communication, as well as Skype for Business, where our telephone line rings. Once we're logged in, we check our calendar for any meetings of the day. Over and above this, we assign queries to each other depending on a weekly roster. We label queries to allow for future tracking as well as statistics. We pride ourselves to responding to queries within a half a day and keep lines of communication open with the user. We have a comprehensive list of email response templates, all thanks to my colleague Des, who spent many hours behind the scenes compiling this for us. We use this to ensure that there is clear instruction and minimal error on our part. I now stop to hand over to my colleague Des. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Donna. As mentioned, I'm Des and I work with Donna in the Learning Technologies team. Together with our colleagues Luabalo and Erin, we form the Vula support team led by Sam Lee Pan. So as Don has outlined, our problem-solving skills are key in supporting staff and students at the university. Sometimes we create little screenshots to show users how to do basic Vula tasks. 
Other times we find that scheduling MS Teams one-on-one -on -one sessions are very beneficial, especially using the nifty screen share feature to solve problems. Also, we simply sometimes use screenshots because that can also reveal the issue and fix the problem. Over and above our daily tasks, we also do the following as a team. We create documentation, resources, help guides, screencasts. We also test, document and report any learning technology software issues. Often we present our tools at webinar training sessions and we also assist with Bula upgrades and quality assurance testing. We also provide priority support for online examinations at the university. Let's talk about Vula usage. So the following graphs have been extracted from our department's 2020 annual report and we thought the information here would be very useful to share. Due to remote teaching, you'll notice here that Vula usage increased from 2019 to 2020. Concurrent hourly users peaked at 9,511 in 2020, which was a 33% increase compared to the 2019 maximum of 7,147. The number of daily users over a 24-hour period peaked at around 21,500 from 20,000 in 2019. Now this graph shows that in 2020, Vula help requests almost doubled. There were 11,015 support requests received and resolved versus 6,151 support requests in 2019. There were large spikes in volumes from the expected start of the academic year, the start of emergency remote teaching in April, and the start of the second semester in August. In some months, this tripled normal volumes and there was effectively no downtime. A total of 2,386 phone calls were registered in 2020. And so we've come to the end of our presentation. Now we know it sounds like a mouthful, but that's what life is like as a virtual Vula consultant. Complex, demanding, often requiring multitasking. No two days are the same. We appreciate you taking the time to listen to us and look forward to connecting with you in the future. Excellent. Okay. Um, now let's see here. I've got to make sure that I do my, uh, I'm, I'm learning to make sure I've got the controls right. Okay, so that was uh, Donna Lewis and Desiree McKay uh, from the University of South Africa. So now let's go to Inga Donkervert in the Netherlands, uh, talking about using 360 images and interactive videos in Xerti. Inga, are you ready to ro ready to go? Yes, I am. Can you hear me properly? We can. Sure. Can <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. I will share my screen. And I will share myself. I'm through good, Dinga. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, my name is Inga Donkervoort and I'm from the 30 team. And um, we have a few new pages that are really working well in the Corona years as we have now. And it seems to be that in the next years, the um corona and the blended and and hybrid uh, working forms uh, will stay so um i will show you a few pages that uh, could be really useful for example if you have to uh, present a school or a museum or whatever where you can't visit um and you have a good way to uh, present it in an active way for the ones that doesn't know, Xerti is an authoring tool, and with Xerti you can create um, media-rich, uh, interactive, uh, highly accessible modules that you can add to your learning environment, your website, or to um, send just send a link. Um, it's uh, you can also create SCORM packages to add in your learning environment, or use uh, LTI. We use Tsugi. And um, it's also XAPI enabled, so you can track uh, and add the results into your environment or in an, a learning record store. If you want to see more about Xerti, tomorrow there will be a session about escape rooms with Xerti, and there's also a state of the project video. I will add this link into the Sakai, Try Sakai environment, so you have also um, uh, you can look at it later. This is the first page, uh, page, uh, page I want to tell you about. It's the 360 image. And it's a page uh, 
and it's really useful, for example, uh, when you, uh, for a museum, or if you have a lot of photographs from a, a specific place and you want to show them, and you can add information to it. So if I'm, uh, I'm now here, and I can just wandering around, it's a bit slow because it's remote, but um, I can just wander around here in this beautiful castle. And I can uh, take a look closer to the castle. I also can go on and I come in another environment. I can get some information about the river trend and I can also go back into the castle again. Um, here I have some information. This is just text and images, but I can also add audio and video and um, uh, other media into it. Let me see, I have to go back here. Another nice thing you can do with this page is to make it even more playful and interactive. Um, you can add uh, locks on specific places so a student or user can't go in un unless he has the code. Um, so you have to walk around here a bit and then you learn a lot about um, uh, King John. If we had time enough, then I would um, let you play around yourself. Uh, but then you get this uh, question and I have to add the password to go on to the next um, phase. And now you see it's unlocked and I can go in there. So it's really useful page with really a lot of interactive uh, elements in it. And you just need um, uh, a 360 uh, photograph. You can take it with your phone and then add it here. So the other page I want to show you is the interactive video. It's uh, a bit similar, but it's also different. In this case, I don't add um, an, um, uh, an photograph, a 360 photograph, but just a video. So when I start playing, then um, you see um, a nice picture of uh, Amsterdam and you see here an introduction text. And um, here below on the, I will stop it. Here below you see the small dots. Um, each dot is connecting to a new uh, interactivity. And you can also add uh, questions, text and other modules into it. Um, in this case, I have a few uh, text uh, buttons. You can also add uh, images in there. And this is a question. So how many mint windmills did you see at the beginning of the video? Can someone answer that real quickly in the chat? <laughs> no, but I will try it. Oh, that's a pity. It were three, uh, but almost uh, good. Um, then I go, uh, click on continue, then the video goes on, and then I get another question. I can also use um, uh, icons instead of uh, that you immediately see the question or the text. And um, this is also what you can do. This is the same question. Um, so I take uh, the wrong answer. So two again, check, okay, it's the wrong answer. And now it says, okay, go back to the beginning and then you can see it. So I will go to the end. And what I also can do is click the right question and um, I don't need to do the whole uh, video and you will see that I will go to here. So, so this uh, I skipped and now I come to the last uh, action point and it's already, it's, it's again an icon and in this case it's a whole new module. I can click around. And if I want to go on, I click just on the play button and then it uh, should disappear, but I forgot to let it disappear. So this is the interactive video and the media 360 page. And we have a lot of other uh, beautiful new pages that um, you can use in this uh, uh, Corona time with a lot of hybrid and blended and online learning. That's really nice. And this is all part yeah. of Xerti, right? This is all Xerti, yes. Yeah. And you can even track track the interactive video, so you get results also in your uh, environment. Fabulous. Outstanding. Yeah, you're getting lots of nice comments in the chat, too. Good deal. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Inga. Okay. I appreciate it. This is, this is marvelous. 
All okay, right. bye. I hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Real quick, uh, Martin, a question was asked. Is, um, is it easy to use Xerti within Sakai? Yes, I think so, because you can embed it or you can uh, add it with an LTI link. So I, I don't know Sakai that well, but um, I think uh, you can really use it with, uh, very easy. It's it's a good question and one that I need to dig into, too. I mean, I sort of have the same questioning. And so that's, yeah, thank you. Yeah, try it. Please do and let me know and uh, or share a screen video so I can share it in the community again. Okay, cool. Good deal. All right. Well, being the taskmaster that I am, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to move on here. So our, our next, we're now going to Canada to Jacques Renault, good friend of mine, uh, speeding up grading with Karuta 3.0 dashboards, new Karuta 3.0. So, uh, Jacques, are you ready to take it away? Yes, I need to share my screen. Yep, if you can I will, give me the link. Let me make you presenter here. Yeah. Um, okay, you should now be the presenter, and so you should be able to do that. Okay, on my screen. Um, can you see that? It's coming. Yep. Okay. You got it. Go for it. Uh, thanks, Martin. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to talk about uh, grading <laughs> and about speeding up grading with Karuta 3.0 dashboard. So have you done some grading recently? I'm not sure because we are sort of technical people, but I've done some pretty much grading in the past, and I can tell you that grading is really important, especially online and especially during this pandemic. I mean, you have to sort of help students and through their learning process. But grading can be a challenge. Uh, you have to click, scroll, search, copy, consult rubrics, uh, whatever, communicate the result to students. Not, not that easy. And Caruta has a very uh, interesting new feature called, uh, well, it's a dashboard that can really streamline the grading process uh, through reports. Re reports are a way to create customized table from elements in a portfolio identified by cementing tag. So you can have all sorts of portfolio. And I, I want to be large with portfolio. It can be capstone project, internship, career center sort of things, uh, rubrics type. And then from, uh, from the students, you can sort of have a report and create those very specialized dashboard for for instructor. So I'm going to move on to uh, a student uh, portfolio. I'm going to click on skills. These are broad skills that the students should develop, uh, like working in an involving digital environment. I'm going to click here. There are two specific skills that the student has to sort of work on it, to sort of document. Uh, he, he has to put evidence here, uh, self-evaluate here. But of course, uh, instructor evaluation will be very useful, uh, either by evaluation or by comment. So this is... Uh, a student has to do that for all the um, uh, the skills, and uh, there are only two here, but obviously there could be a lot more. And the uh, faculty, the instructor has to grade that. So I'm going to move on to the instructor portfolio, and especially on my student, which is the, the sort of dashboard that uh, Karuta can create using a very straightforward language. And there's a uh, here you, you will find all the skills of the student, uh, myself, one student, and then another student, and another student. So it's very easy to sort of ac access. And what's amazing is we have a feature called uh, Overview. And if I click on Overview, I'm going to, the, the instructor can see the actual page, uh, the student page that I show you before. And, and of course, what's missing in, is the instructor evaluation. So it's very easy for an instructor to sort of survey uh, what students have done. And then you can check how many documents have been uh, uploaded. You can check the self-assessment by student and the, the instructor can uh, evaluate what students have done. 
and he can even write comments. And I'm going to write very small write comments here. So, and if I look back at uh, the page uh, of my student before, well, of course, <clears throat> uh, the grading appeared, and uh, and I can move on to the to the next um, to the next skill, and uh, eventually to the next student. So. Uh, of course, this is a, a, a report that has been tailored to this portfolio, but of course you can make it for any kind of learning uh, and uh, project, uh, as I said, capstone, internship, whatever. In Caruta, you can obviously create special report for if you want to download the, the results. And it's easy to sort of uh, relate uh, the evaluation that I put like excellent, good, and whatever in terms of numbers. And these are the skills, uh, C1, C2, C3, C4. It's a, just a demo. And I can get that. And you can click on here, and you will get uh, an Excel file that you can upload in whatever uh, learning and uh, environment you have. So uh, this is kind of exciting. And I think we can really improve both uh, student uh, feedback and also uh, teacher uh, work. And if you want to have a look at carutaproject.org, you can get, uh, you can get uh, all the information you need about that. And there's a small video about that if you want to go, uh, if you want to review that. Thanks. Jacques, I hear your timer going off just as my timer went off. <laughs> yeah, I put the time for it, make sure that I, uh, I didn't go over. Thanks. Good, good man. Good man. Thank you very much, Jacques. And I will point out to people that the um, we've got the public chat going, of course, but we also have the shared notes in Big Blue Button. If you have specific questions, then that's a good place that you can add those to. So I'm going to take control back um, and go on to our next one. We're now moving from um, from Canada over to Scotland to my new friend, Duncan McGrewer. And Duncan, are you ready to take it away, sir? I am. Thank you, Martin. Yes, so right, go for it. You jumped in there. Um, thanks very much for uh, giving me some time to speak and just to introduce um, our uh, installation of UPortal at the University of Edinburgh called MyEd. Uh, I'm not so brave as Inga and um, and Jack. I'm, there'll be no live demo here. Sorry about that one. Uh, and because I fear Martin's clock, I'm going to try and rattle through this just <laughs> as quickly as I can. Um, so just to say that, you know, our UPortal installation called MyEd, uh, we're trying to meet some clear organizational challenges here. So the University of Edinburgh is big and it's devolved and it's weird. So we're uh, trying to say there's no one answer to anything. Even if you asked, how should I matriculate or, you know, how should I do one thing? There's there's many different answers. So we're trying to cut through uh, difficulties in the organization. Um, and we also have a diversity of communications channels. It's very noisy. Sometimes it's difficult to know what's important to do in your day. And the university is also good at creating its own acronyms. So acronym heavy and understanding light. Um, this is a lot of people's first experience of the institution. So what we're trying to do is make it easy for them to try and try and fit in with our culture by guiding them through what they should be doing uh, exactly with their day. We know though that people gravitate to what's easy and familiar. So we're trying to, to meet those kind of user expectations as well. So we have my ed is our portal solution. Um, let's people manage their day so simplify some of those key tasks they've got to do to to, to um register for courses so that is to matriculate um to get their card to get into their virtual learning environment to look at their records to get into the calendar and email um, and one of the reasons we really love using a uh, portal for this is that um, it's got good interoperability with some of the things that we're using so with our virtual learning environments with our um, email calendar solutions um, with our library. There's lots of great ways of, of doing this within the system. Um, another thing is we, we're trying to provide to people personalized experiences as well. So we know that they feel more welcomed at our organization when we understand what they're trying to do. Um, and one of the advantages here, we know who you are. That sounds kind of creepy, but what we do is try and sort of take the information we know about you to try and streamline your life, to actually to provide the things that are of the, the most use uh, to you. Um, the way we organize our portal is that uPortal runs kind of in the, the background. It's the back end there. So it's setting things like permissions and so on. Um, again, one of the reasons we like using uPortal for this is it provides what we need. and doesn't bring along a load of junk that we don't. So it's really easy to, to, to get up and running for us. 
We then have a React. So this is a JavaScript framework that's running the, the front bit that you see so that we can personalize it to our campus and try and make it a seamless experience as people move between our web and portal presences. Uh, we're still working uh, beyond that. Um, we have a mega menu. So as you can see in the right hand screenshot here, we have a large menu along the, the top of the screen that allows people to look through categories of, of tasks and tools and information that they need to, to manage their day. Some of those links take you out directly to a service. So where we haven't integrated it, where there's an expectation that people will understand what they're doing in that destination service and it's a, a congruent experience, it links out to them. But in some of them, we've tried to integrate it in so that people who you know don't have a great experience of using virtual classroom software or a great experience of, of doing a specific task can actually manage it within a portal. We bring the most important elements directly to, to them. Um, at the risk of being self-serving, I've just done a presentation in one of the breakout rooms about our communications options here. So I'll just kind of refer everyone to the, to the recording of that. But what we have is communication options to bring either personalized or campus-wide communications to people that need it. So for high impact and important communications, we can bring these easily to people. Um, through another one of our um, open source superior programs called Fizan, we bring notifications in of, of uh, individual important things that people want to, want to, to see and, and do. So tasks that they need to perform. Um, and leaning heavily on some work that was done by the um, the UK government digital service, so the GDS, they're kind of a gold standard of presenting these things. And we've also established an open and transparent roadmap of the things that are, are next for us, so we can build organizational understanding of what we are trying to do and to try and get more people to, to buy into that idea so they get into the ecosystem. Um, you can have a look at this one if you want to, but we are trying to create deeper and better personalization through relevant and, and timely access to tools. Uh, we want things to be accessible. So we're looking at how these things display on a mobile. Have we got that exactly right? Um, and actually, we have a student working with us over the summer, Sean Ed, who's, who's in the room, um, who we've let loose on the, the analytics of this one to try and understand how people are, are using that. And we'll, we'll publish those results when they come up. Um, we're supporting communities. So again, we're working with the guys at Unicon, um, uh, Benito and, and Chris, who I think are, are in amongst here, um, about bringing Fizan, so that's a notification service, trying to bring that to some, some greater maturity. And we're running a set of technical upgrades. So we're updating Uport, we're updating React, and we're also looking at how Google Analytics, the next version of Google Analytics, is going to work for us. All of which you can have a look at on the roadmap if you care to be interested. If you want to read about any of that, I've got it in blog format. And that is me, Martin. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm looking at the clock going, oh dear, <laughs> this is going so fast. So I'm going to, Wilma, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Florida, to, to Wilma. Uh, with, who's with Aperio and with Longsight. And yep, there's went my timer. So. <laughs> okay, you can hear me now, right? Yes, we can. Go for it. Okay, okay so um, what I'm going to talk to you guys about today is a, um, is a, a technique for groups. So a lot of um, online learning has moved, um, you know, online sort of by and by no fault of its own <laughs> with the pandemic. Um, so uh, we expect that these trends will continue. So there's going to be a lot more of online in the future um, now that people have kind of gotten their feet wet. And so you might be looking for ways to create some community or do some collaborative projects. So um, what I'm going to show you today is a skill, skills mapping activity. Um, it's a, an activity that can really be tailored to any kind of group context. So it's great as like a team building activity or an ice breaking activity if you have small groups working together in a class. Um, it helps individual team members visualize their contributions. And it also helps groups figure out where they might have um, strengths and where they might need some additional assistance to kind of round out their expertise on the team. So um, the activity is not Oops, it's not necessarily Sakai specific. I do have it set up in Sakai, just as an illustration. So let me show you um, what I've done. And I have this in the assignment tool in Sakai because I wanted to, um, to use assignments to make it a graded activity. Although you could do this in a number of different ways. You could put it in lessons, you could just make it an ungraded um, thing that you send out to students. 
Um, in my sample here, I've, I've set it around um, multiple intelligences. I don't know if you're familiar with Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences where um, people have things like visual or, or kinesthetic or spatial strengths um, that, uh, you know, kind of uh, determine how they interact best and how they can best present or um, retain information. So anyway, it's a good way to, um, to get groups who don't know each other um, kind of um, more familiar with how their team members um, prefer to interact and maybe the types of, of strengths that they might have to bring to a team project. So I've set it up with groups. Um, and the reason I did three groups, even though I'm using a group um, tool, is because I have three different spreadsheets that they're going to. Um, and But I do want to collect the submissions as one submission per group. So I've released each of these to three separate groups, and, um, and they're all uh, as a single activity. So let me just show you what this looks like. It's a two-part exercise. So this is the instructions that I have in Sakai. But the bulk of the work happens in Google, which is why I'm saying that it's not necessarily Sakai specific. Uh, it could be used in any learning management system or even outside of a learning management system. So I'm going to scrunch this down a little bit or actually zoom out a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. So this spreadsheet is set up um, to automatically create these charts down here. It's like a little radar graph chart in Google. And the student would go through, these are some sample students that I have in here, and self-evaluate. They would put in their own numbers on a, a range of one to five of how strong they feel in any of these you know, multiple intelligence fields. So for example, visual spatial, um, there's a three in here. Let's say I change that to a five, my graph down here will update. And so you'll see that um, based on an individual person's strengths, the shape is going to change. Um, so it might be, you know, very spiky in one area if they're really strong in one thing but don't have much experience in the rest. Or it might be more rounded if it's somebody who's kind of a master of all uh, techniques. So the, the activity asks users to um, rate themselves in their current, you know, like today, um, and then how they hope to be in the future at some future date. Maybe you give them a deadline. Maybe um, this is something that you just ask them to non-specified future day um, where they would like to, to basically strengthen their skills. Um, and you have all of the group members do this. So each group member has, um, you know, the same kind of setup and they go through individually in part one to do this part of the activity. And then for the second part, there's another tab here in this spreadsheet um, where they paste in the numbers for their current state. So you've got all three, or I'm sorry, all four, sample students across here at the top with their um, various numbers, and it draws on this um, kind of collective graph. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. So the colors are um, specific to the user up here, and you can see how the group as a whole, um, how their strengths um, map to each other. So you can see that even though um, you know this person over here in kind of the orange is stronger in inter interpersonal and intrapersonal. Um, the, there's somebody else over here in the purple that's better in logical, mathematical, body, bodily kinesthetic, and they kind of uh, balance each other out. So that's where the, the title of, of this uh, presentation comes, is the shape of the group. And so you can also have, um, as a, a kind of self-reflective activity, have the people in the group um, work together to to look at this and see you know where their gaps exist, where they've identified strengths as a group, and then you can have them also look at their future state um, to see are they more well rounded at that point? Are there any remaining gaps? Um, so it's a really nice activity for getting people thinking about group dynamics um, in a constructive way that they can then um, use as they uh, work together on collaborative projects within the course. So um, that, I mean, go to my last slide. Um, so I say, yeah, I do. Tell us where to get at this. <laughs> yeah, so I do have a copy of this. It's a blank copy of this uh, worksheet in Google. It's, it's open to anybody to edit. So if you're gonna use it, make a copy for yourself first. Um, but I've, uh, this bit.ly will take you to the uh, the Google Sheet, and you can copy that and use it um, in your own classes. So 
and I hope you find some use from it. Excellent. If you have any questions, let me know. What what a nice uh, what a nice combination of things we've talked about here in the lightning talks today. We are very very tight on time, folks. So I'm going to say that this has been a very illuminating and a lot of fun. But before I let you go. Let me also say that there are a few slots open later on during the conference for some more lightning talks. So now that you've seen what the format looks like and you've got an idea, let us know, let Jen or Kathy know, and they'll get you scheduled in. Uh, but thanks everyone for being here. This has been fabulous. Off you go to your next session. Um, it's, it's a whirlwind lightning talk.